Their leader is dead, executed like a common criminal. But then, stories of resurrection and an impossible mission. Jesus' chosen 12, the apostles, are instructed to carry a new faith to the ends of the earth. Andrew, Peter, and James the Great are said to have blazed a trail west. Stories steeped in legend, myth, and magic. Missionaries evangelizing on unfamiliar ground. The threat was real. One conversion at a time, clashing with the old order, climaxing in deadly confrontations. They will be beaten, they will be scourged, they will be tortured. The stories of their martyrdom enshrine them in history and inspire the faithful. Santiago de Compostela, Spain. Here, at the western edge of Europe, a sacred shrine rises high. A church was built here in the 11th century, following an incredible discovery. Legend says a shepherd, guided by light, revealed the resting place of one of Jesus's 12 apostles. Early Christian tradition claims the apostles Andrew and Peter ventured west from Jerusalem in the early first century. But many believe St. James the Great, or Santiago, delivered the gospel all the way to Spain. And they say his remains are buried somewhere beneath these floors. Santiago is one of the apost Jesus apostles. And uh, he, uh, he, uh, his tomb is here and uh, inside. This is the crypt containing the relics of Saint Santiago, Saint James, discovered in the ninth century, and there have been two previous basilicas built over this area. Saint James is a national hero. Tens of thousands come here each year to honor him. The pilgrims come here to venerate St. James uh, his relics and ask for his intercession and their prayers. This place was visited in 1982 by Pope John Paul II. Here there are Canada, Korea or Japan to Buenos Aires. Today, Santiago de Compostela is the name of the church and the city surrounding. Together, they have embraced the legend of James. Hotels and restaurants have hosted pilgrims for centuries. Shops and markets offer an array of memorabilia. And the cathedral never rests. In the cathedral, the principal thing is the celebrations that exist in different languages. That is, that from the seven and a half in the morning, turnando sacerdotes que en distintas lenguas y en las capillas de la catedral celebran misa para los peregrinos. James the Great remains a fixture in the life of Santiago de Compostela. And tomorrow is his feast day. And as the energy level in the city rises, a question remains. How did Christianity gain a foothold so far from the Holy Land? According to the faithful in Spain, one of Jesus' closest disciples delivered it here personally. But that story and the other apostles' journeys aren't found in the Bible. They are apocrypha, local legends, and folklore. Jerusalem, 33 AD. Just outside the city walls, 
a brutal scene is unfolding. What looks like an ordinary Roman execution will ultimately change the course of history. So the crucifixion was really the heart of this new Christian religion. Jesus of Nazareth is about to be crucified for claiming to be a king. The crucifixion is central to Christianity because the idea that Jesus suffered and died to expiate the sins of mankind was really the core moment for that whole theological message to, to happen. With an angry mob looking on, Roman soldiers crucify him. They believe it should silence Jesus and his followers once and for all. 50 days later, the Bible tells us that same Jesus has risen, walked on earth, and ascended to heaven. So the story of the ascension is that after the crucifixion and Jesus' three days of, of being dead and harrowing hell, he returns and he stays with his followers. Jesus tells his closest allies to continue his mission. He says they must carry on without him. And as Jesus is talking to them, he blesses them, he commissions them to go out to the world. After he blesses them, he's lifted up. But the apostles are 12 ordinary men, hardly theologians. For many of the apostles, this becomes a true test of faith because they have to believe in things that they've never conceived of before. Without their leader, they don't know what comes next. They are waiting for a sign. Suddenly, in the flash of an eye, the apostles' mission becomes clear. The Bible's book of Acts describes an event known as Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descending from heaven. It is described as a miraculous moment as a supernatural presence fills the room. It is the Holy Spirit sent by God, fulfilling Jesus' prophecy. There's a loud sound of wind. There's a vision of tongues of fire settling over their heads, and they receive an inner conviction about their role and their activity as witnesses to what they have seen. Then, the Bible describes a miracle as the apostles are granted the gift of tongues, allowing them to preach to all nations. And suddenly they have at their command every other language on the planet. All of a the sudden they understand. Now we know why we followed this Christ for three years. Now we know exactly when he said, go out to the ends of the earth and preach. Of Jesus' chosen 12, legends and stories say three apostles are sent west, as far away as Spain. They are Andrew, Peter, and James the Great. The Bible tells us little about Andrew. The apostle Andrew was one of Jesus' first followers. He was one of the first four apostles called by Jesus. And according to some accounts, he was in the boat with Peter when they were both called together. He was there right from the very beginning. The Bible also suggests Andrew is intelligent and may have been an interpreter between Jesus and Greek pilgrims. He was bilingual. He could speak both Aramaic which is the traditional Jewish language spoken by Jesus, for example, but also Greek. Peter, also known as Simon Peter, is the brother of Andrew. Peter is one of the best known apostles, phrased as meek, humble, and loving. Peter appears often as the head of the apostles and is known in, in Catholic tradition as the Prince of the Apostles. Jesus receives his first acknowledgement as the Son of the Living God from Peter. And Jesus immediately replies, 
Only God could have revealed this to you. But Peter's flaw is well documented in the New Testament. Leading up to the crucifixion, Peter denies knowing Jesus, even in his final, most desperate moments. Peter, as we know, is a rather impetuous individual. Um, he was quite bold in his decisions, but he was also weak. Um, when it came time to uh, stand up for his faith, he denied the Lord three times. Peter has a lot to make up for. Finally, James the Great has been called a powerful speaker who connects with the common man. St. James the Elder, the brother of St. John the Evangelist, who is called by our Lord, they're the sons of thunder. The Bible tells us James and his brother John, the sons of thunder, were not shy in suggesting violence against the enemies of Jesus. James and his brother quite possibly had very strong tempers. Despite that, uh, it's not an obstacle to holiness. And in spite of those things, the Lord can choose us to be instruments in spreading the gospel. Can James carry the gospel message to the Spanish coast and the western perimeter of the known world? In the aftermath of Pentecost, the book of Acts says the apostles begin preaching. But not everyone is happy. The apostles are a threat to the establishment. So in the Acts of the Apostles, this new preaching ministry is starting to pick up steam in Jerusalem. Early parts of Acts of the Apostles talks about the apostles and that they continued to preach despite threats of death and punishment. Jesus' followers are not favored by the king, Herod Agrippa I. Any religion that contradicts or challenges the authority of a king is going to be a threat. The Bible says the apostles are also at odds with the Sanhedrin, the Jewish temple's council. The authorities in the temple were extremely disturbed by what was going on. And so everything preached, everything said, challenged the authorities of the patriarchs of Judaism. The apostles' world quickly becomes tense. They have enemies all around. Something has to give. After performing miracles and ministering on the home front, the apostles are finally arrested. Well, there are a number of accounts where the apostles are cast into prison. They're jailed by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, and according to the Acts of the Apostles, this is really due to jealousy. It's not due to any particular actual political or religious threat. The Apostles' plans and their lives are now in jeopardy. The Apostles were terrified that what happened to Jesus would happen to them. The Apostles' journey from the Holy Land to the West is steeped in myth and legend. But the first chapter in that journey is recorded in the Bible itself, the Acts of the Apostles. In the aftermath of the arrival of the Holy Spirit and in the midst of Herod Agrippa's reign, the Apostles find themselves rotting in jail they will need a miracle. Now in their most desperate moment, the Bible reveals an earthly ally, a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, Gamaliel, implores Jewish authorities to leave the apostles alone. Rabbinic authorities within Jerusalem counsel that the disciples in fact should not be persecuted, instead, the test of time should be allowed to see whether their teaching 
was in fact valid. He says, if this is of human origin, it will die out. There's nothing that we need to do about it. But if it, this is from God, then it will continue and there's nothing we can do to stop it. The apostles are released to the world. By the second century AD, the Christian faith had spread to Western Europe and Spain. The Bible recounts apostolic journeys as far west as Rome, but everything beyond is steeped in legend. So the formation of the New Testament canon was a gradual process that took several centuries. And in the process, people began to realize that some of the stories seemed to have gaps. Through extra biblical texts, we find more clues, tracing a timeline to the West, the journeys of Andrew, Peter, and James the Great. So these different apocryphal texts give us a number of things. They give us the human craving for story satisfied. They explain different key matters of doctrine in the arguments that these apostles have with their pagan persecutors. And additionally, they just tell us what these apostles did and they explain how the gospel got to so many different geographic places in a relatively speaking short time frame. Legend says the Apostle Andrew is one of the first to embark on an international ministry. According to the apocryphal Acts of Andrew, he heads north, exploring modern-day Turkey, then west. So Andrew would be traveling around and preaching and trying to convince people to believe in this new gospel of Jesus Christ. The Acts of Andrew records him winning converts. Finally, Andrew arrives in the community of Patras, Greece. Here, he establishes a Christian stronghold. Patras becomes the center of Andrew's ministry. He establishes churches, he preaches, he gets a, a, a group body of clergy in place. Uh, the people are uh, receptive to him. Uh, and in fact, he becomes quite popular according to the stories. Meanwhile, the apostle Peter has become a powerful leader. Originally known as the denier of Jesus, the Bible says he has shed this mantle of weakness. The book of Acts describes Peter as a leader, preaching at Pentecost and defending the apostles before the courts of the Sanhedrin. And before he dies, Jesus tells Peter he will lead the early church. The apostle Peter, of course, is the most famous of the apostles. He is the rock of the church. He is the bedrock and foundation of the very beginnings of the church. And he is said to be the head apostle, essentially. Now Peter sets off on one of the most famous ministries in history. Some scholars believe he heads to Rome. Rome would have been just a shock to the senses. The apocryphal acts of Peter describe a hostile arrival. The local wizard, Simon the Magician, doesn't want Peter on his turf. Part of Peter's ministry in Rome was involved the great contest and debate with Simon Magnus, the sorcerer who was very much a favorite of Emperor Nero. And of course, they have this contest back and forth. The stories describe Simon showing off his power 
levitating and thrilling the crowd. And there are different versions of what happens next. The acts of Peter recount that Peter begs Jesus to make Simon fall. And he does and breaks his leg in three places. Finally, the crowd accepts Peter and turns on the wizard, stoning him to death. The Bible and the apocryphal acts of Andrew and Peter describe the arrival of Christianity in Greece and Rome. But what about further west, the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire? Legend says the Apostle James is up to the task. James, the son of Zebedee, according to legend, makes it all the way through to the westernmost part of the world. When he went to Spain, he took a boat from the Middle East and would have taken the very well-charted trade routes to Italy, and then he would have made landfall. James the Great is now ready to venture to the ends of the known world. What you are willing to be martyred for in turn defines exactly what this Christianity is. Sometime around 38 AD, a legend known as the Santiago Creed describes James the Great embarking on a mission that will ring through history. The scope of his journey is nearly beyond belief. Even in a straight line across open water, Spain is nearly 2,000 miles away. The precise means that James used to travel are unknown to us, though we do know something of how people as a whole traveled during this period. And basically, uh, you had a choice of going overland, or there was also sea travel. No one knows exactly how he does it, but somehow, James the Great is said to have reached the Spanish coast. Like the Western missions of Andrew and Peter, the Bible tells us little about James's apostolic quest. But in Hispania, modern-day Spain, there is little doubt who founded the faith of a nation. Spain has a very strong tradition of crediting James for establishing the church there. De forma que eh, se ha tenido conciencia desde muy antiguo que aquí había el sepulcro de un discípulo de Cristo. When James arrives in Spain, he lands on the southern coast in Andalusia, and then he follows the Roman road network into major Roman settlements. But while Hispania is Roman territory, it lacks a receptive audience. Stories say its population leaves James without many friendly faces. It is a difficult task. The people worship Roman emperors and their deities. He had a very difficult time actually affecting mass conversion. He tries to build churches. He tries to preach and convert the population. But for some reason, they're just not interested. It doesn't take. Throughout James's time in Spain, he names bishops in Braga, now northern Portugal, Lugo, and Astorga. But he wins few converts. The stories of James say that he didn't do very well. He converted nine people, something like that, after a lot of work. However, he's determined to set things up on a good footing. And so he actually makes three of them into future bishops of what will become important cities in Spain. James enjoys little success on his mission when legends describe a miracle as a familiar face appears. So James is returning toward the seacoast to get a boat to go back. He's very discouraged. He gets to Saragossa, and he has a vision. The Virgin Mary, who's still alive at this point, actually appears to him in Spain of all places. 
and she is standing with a pillar and announces to him that he is to build a church around this pillar that she will leave here as a sign of her favor. James is stunned. Mary assures him his work has not been in vain. Once she has finished speaking with James, angels then take her back on her journey to Jerusalem. The stories say James is overjoyed. He builds a church dedicated to Mary around the sacred pillar, the Basilica of Nuestra Senora de Pilar, Basilica of the Virgin of the Pillar. The church says that pillar still stands today. James the Great has planted a tiny seed, but with a promise from the Virgin Mary that the seed will grow, his time in Spain has come to an end. James, however, does not get to leave Spain via angels. He has to take the long road back, having made very few converts, and heads right back to Jerusalem where he started. James the Great returns to the Holy Land. No one knows exactly why. One of the possible reasons for James' return to Jerusalem was, um, as sometimes happened, to confer with the other apostles and also to gain encouragement from uh, living in the community, the apostolic community with the others. Whatever the reason, he returns to a time of great tribulation. According to the Bible, the reign of Herod Agrippa I is not getting any easier. Herod Agrippa was one of the most cunning politicians in his family. And that is saying a great deal because all of the descendants of Herod the Great were known for their wiliness. For reasons not fully explained by the scriptures, James the Great is arrested. But at least one early scribe suggests the arrest may have been the fatal flaw for the apostle known as Son of Thunder. One theory is that his fiery temperament could have played a role. Jesus' disciples in the holy city can only wait to see what happens next. For the apostles, the world becomes hostile quickly. According to the apocryphal texts, the apostles Andrew and Peter have remained in Greece and Rome. Their ministries have flourished, but they will soon face their own persecution. In the apocryphal acts of Andrew, the Greek governor Agiades calls on Andrew to heal his wife. Andrew agrees. So according to the acts of Andrew, another one of these apocryphal texts, Andrew is in Greece and the proconsul's wife is ill with a deadly fever and he is standing by her bedside and she gets up and is healed. and she immediately converts to Christianity, to this new faith that he is bringing to them. But this was more than the governor wanted. Unfortunately, as a result of this new faith and this conversion, she eventually leaves her husband and spends her time focusing on learning about Christianity. Naturally, this displeases her husband. He promptly throws Andrew in jail and signs up to have him executed. On November 28, 69 AD, stories say Andrew is hauled to the seashore and crucified on a cross. Andrew sees the cross waiting for him from a distance and he says, Hail, O cross, take me to my master. He approaches the cross, there's more beautiful praise of it, and then he willingly allows himself to be crucified. The governor insists he be tied, not nailed, lengthening his pain. And the tradition has it 
that he was crucified in an X-shaped cross that's come to be known of as St. Andrew's cross because he didn't want to be in the same posture as Jesus. Governor Agiades hopes wild dogs will tear him apart, but no such luck. A huge crowd gathers, and they want to save the apostle because they've seen his miracles, and they are trying to save him, and Andrew says, no, do not save me from martyrdom. I desire this martyrdom. And as he's hung on the cross, he preaches for two days to the assembled crowd, to this group of people, and he converts all of them. The people begin to revolt. They say, bring him down, bring him off of the cross, take him down. Finally, the governor agrees to spare him. But as Andrew is being cut down, he dies. And then there is a blinding light, and Andrew achieves his martyrdom. Five years earlier in Rome, the city is burning. The Emperor Nero blames the Christians. We know that the city of Rome did actually have a massive fire at this time, but the legends almost immediately sprang up that Nero himself had actually had the fire set on purpose just so he could see how utterly beautiful the flames would be in the distance. The apocryphal acts of Peter suggest Peter knows his days are numbered. Nero brutally tortures the Christian population. The Emperor Nero used horrific public execution of Christians. The faithful in Rome urged Peter to rescue himself from the city. Peter flees the city. But encounters a vision that changes everything. And as he gets to the gates of Rome, he's shocked to see our Lord himself coming into the city. He says, Lord, where are you going? Christ says, I'm going into Rome to be crucified in your place. Now, in his most crucial moment, the story says Peter does not deny Jesus. And it's shortly after that moment that Peter understands that that is his role, that he is supposed to go to Rome and to be crucified. He is put in jail. But even here, Peter wastes no time converting the guards the Romans send to watch over him. Finally, he too is taken to die. In a final act of humility, Peter asks to be crucified upside down, not worthy of dying like his savior. Peter was crucified. We're told that when Peter reached the cross, he said, turn my cross around. He explains that he wishes to have his head earthward and his feet toward heaven because he will be traveling from earth to heaven. As opposed to Jesus, who was crucified right side up, Peter explains, because he had descended from heaven to earth. He dies on the cross. His body is taken and buried in a little cemetery, a, a public cemetery, right nearby. And we know from excavations that cemetery still exists under the Vatican Basilica, and that it's been venerated as the place where Peter is buried. In Jerusalem, the Bible says James the Great has been arrested. 
So in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, we start to get more stories of Herod Agrippa now persecuting these Christians in earnest at this point. James is the first one, the first ones to be arrested. And then that becomes the occasion where Herod Agrippa, in his skillful attempt to ingratiate himself to the Romans and to placate the Jews, decides to kill James, the son of Zebedee. Herod Agrippa has him tried and sentenced to death. But in a final moment of shame, legends say the man who turned James into the authorities repents and begs James's forgiveness. His accuser is sentenced to death with him. James the Great is to be an example. So what we know from the Acts of the Apostles is that he was killed, that it was James the brother of John, and that he was put to death by Herod, by the sword. Herod Agrippa killed the apostle James the Greater. The death of St. James uh, is the only death of an apostle recorded in scripture that everyone agrees on. So we have the first of the 12 giving up his life as a witness to what he had seen in the life of Jesus. And this is a pretty big moment in the history of the early church. In the aftermath of the execution of James the Great, the Santiago Creed says James's body is protected by his disciples. His remains are taken to Jaffa in Tel Aviv and transported back to Spain. After his execution, James's body was uh, interred in Jerusalem and being an apostle, it would have been ver venerated by the early Christian community. Ultimately, because of his great love for Spain and the preaching that he had done here, his disciples um, brought his relics according to his wishes and by boat transported them back to Spain. In Jerusalem, the first execution of an apostle will lead to others in a systematic attempt to subvert the spread of Christianity. Herod Agrippa is remembered by the Christians as having really viciously tried to quash their movement, having tried to, to end Christianity before it really got going. And for a while, it seems like it will succeed. King Herod Agrippa's reign is about to come to a close. Acts chapter 12 recounts his sickening death, finally punished by God for comparing himself to the divine. Acts chapter 12 recounts a sickening death, finally punished by God for comparing himself to the divine. So the New Testament recounts that Herod Agrippa himself, having succeeded to some extent in stopping these early Christians, is giving a speech, is, is in his glory. And a member of the crowd listening to him says, listen, these are the words of a God, not a man. And because Herod Agrippa doesn't contradict that statement, he's struck down. According to the Bible, he falls down dead and his body is consumed entirely by worms. 
And it is easy, I think, to take that kind of detail and to see it as a matter of window dressing. But as it happens, we have a very good historical source for the life and death of Herod Agrippa's grandfather, Herod the Great, who died in much the same way. There is a medical condition, which is known as Fournier's gangrene. It is a gangrene that develops in the area of the abdomen, is truly dreadful and excruciating way to die. And because there is a great deal of dead flesh, it attracts maggots. This would have been a highly satisfying moment of vengeance for Christians. Flash forward 2,000 years. In Santiago de Compostela, pilgrims are counting down the minutes. At midnight, the Feast of St. James the Great will begin. Many pilgrims have timed their arrival to coincide with this moment. We all made it. It was a stressful time getting through the city. Everyone was really pleased. Everyone was happy. Everyone was together singing. It was a really good feeling. Everyone's here. There's thousands and thousands of people here. There's a huge, huge, great big procession. There's uh, hundreds of people trying to get into mass. We've got the royal family here. We've got all the dignitaries. It's uh, a really important day in Spain. This festival has attracted tens of thousands, from young pilgrims to the devoted faithful. Even the Spanish royal family is here, celebrating Spain's legacy. And with just minutes to go, the energy in Santiago de Compostela is overwhelming. Tomorrow is a special day of the Fest of Santiago. It's, it's crowded. I found uh, this climate a meeting point of uh, the world. It's wonderful. As midnight strikes, the crowd erupts in euphoria. An incredible light show fills the skies. It is an homage to the light legends say guided a shepherd to the tomb of St. James in the 9th century. And today, it celebrates a story that has never died, a tradition of the apostles that has become part of the cultural fabric of Spain at the western edge of the first century world. To this day, the stories of the apostles who headed west remain twisted tales of Bible verse, legend, and folklore. These are the legendary first steps of Christianity's journey. From Jesus' closest followers to a worldwide faith of more than two billion. Deadly Journeys of the Apostles.